We have been focusing on this parable of Jesus for the last four weeks, and today is the conclusion to our journey on finding our way back to God. So today we're wrapping up, I think, what's been an amazing series where we've been talking about five awakenings that can help us find our way back to God. And these awakenings are not just something that happens initially when you find God, but they are awakenings that we continually need in our lives as Christ followers. For those of you who haven't been with us over these four weeks, maybe just to briefly say that this parable, of course, is about a son who asked his father for his share of the inheritance. As we know, he left for a far place and he squandered all the money. He then went to a pig farm because he had run out of cash to find work and he came to his senses, he turned around and he returned to his father's farm. Over these f four weeks we have been looking at f four awakenings that I'll put up on the screen. The first awakening is an awakening to longing where we discover our longings for love purpose and meaning are given to us by God and intend to lead us to God. We then have an awakening to regret where we recognize that we've tried to satisfy those God-given longings in the wrong way, often trapping ourselves in an endless sorry cycle of longing and regret, longing and regret. And in this awakening, we discover that we can always start over. And that's exactly what the prodigal son did. He started over and he decided to return to his father's home. And then there's an awakening to help. When we admit that we are powerless to fulfill our longings on our own, those longings for love and purpose and meaning, we can't we can't accomplish that on our own. And in this awakening we discover there is help. And that that help has a name. And his name is Jesus. And so the prodigal son returns to his father. And he is welcomed by his father back home again. And in that welcoming we discover that he had an awakening of love. And it's a moment when we come to realize that God loves us as sons and daughters, not as servants and slaves. And in this awakening, we discover our identity as deeply loved, unconditionally accepted children of God. That we are not accepted because of what we do. We are not accepted because we follow a whole lot of religious uh, uh, rituals. But we are accepted because God loves us intimately. And so, no matter what you do, you can never earn your way back to God. You can never try and be restored on the basis of what you've done. You can only be restored on the basis of what the Father has done. And so the Father scans the horizon looking for his wayward son, and when his son returns home, we read that he embraces him, he showers him with kisses, he puts sandals on his feet and a ring on his finger, and he calls the servants to bring a fattened calf and to have a feast. And so today we're going to talk about this fifth awakening. It's an awakening to life. I don't know about you, but have you ever felt like you're going through life, but there's no life going through you? Today we want to address this question. How do we continually awaken to life? What is this life that Jesus talked so much about? And so the prayer of this fifth awakening is this, God, if you are real, make yourself real to me. Awaken in me the confidence that I can live a brand new life. Now there are two passages of scripture that I want us to turn to today. 
The first, if you can just turn on a few pages to John's Gospel, chapter 1. John's Gospel, chapter 1. And then John 10, verse 10. I've got that up on the screen so you don't have to turn to it. The second scripture, Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Some translations say rich and satisfying life. Some translations say abundant life. So what do you think of when you think of abundant life or life to the full? I mean, people often use that expression, go and live your life to the full. Well, what does that actually mean? For most people, a life to the full simply means more of whatever they've already got. And it is that understanding of real living or living life to the full, which I think is at the heart of so much advertising and marketing today. So, for example, you get 25% more Doritos when you buy it in a jumbo bag. You get more of the same. You get more cash back if you use this credit card. You get more frequent flyer miles if you go on this airline. You get more data if you sign up for this particular cell phone package. And so we are continually hunting for more in the hope that more will bring us the life that we so desperately want. And so we connect fullness of life with more in our lives. But that's not what Jesus says. And to understand what Jesus is getting at, let's look at this passage in John 1, 1 to 9. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was... Hello? Thank you. In him was life, and that life was the light of all humankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Now this is the verse I want you to focus on. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. To so far. Often in a great piece of music, the composer begins by stating the themes which he's going to expand upon during the course of his work. John, as a writer and a disciple, does the same. Life and light are two themes in John's gospel. His gospel begins and ends with life. At the very beginning we read that in Jesus was life. And at the very end we read that John's aim in writing the gospel was that all men might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing they may have life in his name. The word is continually on the lips of Jesus. In John 5.40, it is his deep regret that men will not come to him that they might have life. In John 10.10, 10, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. And in the same chapter, Jesus claims that he gives men life and that they will never perish because no one can snatch them out of his hand. He claims that he is the way, the truth, and the life in John 14. 
So what are we to understand by this word life? To fully understand it, we've got to go back to the creation story. From Genesis, we understand that when the first man was created, he was created both physically and spiritually. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago. We looked at this word bios, from where we get the word biology, which refers to the physical dimension of life. In the New Testament, the word for being spiritually alive is captured by the Greek word zoe, which means that our soul or spirit is in union with God. In other words, Adam and Eve were created in perfect union with God. It was God's desire for us from the beginning to be in perfect union with Him. But Adam and Eve sinned against God and they didn't die physically because of that sin, although sin came into the world through, uh, death came into the world through their sin, but rather they died spiritually. Their zoe was destroyed. They were separated from God. They were banished from God's presence. And as we know, we inherited that condition. We are born physically alive, but spiritually dead. Separated, if you wish, from God's presence. In God's original design, knowledge was relational. Knowing someone implied intimate personal relationship. In fact, the Hebrew word for know is used in Genesis 4 verse 1 where we read, Adam knew Eve and she conceived. Adam knew Eve and she conceived. Now that just doesn't make sense unless... Adam knowing Eve speaks of a physical intimacy between them that resulted in conception. And so in Genesis, the word know speaks of intimate relationship. Before the fall, Adam and Eve knew God. In other words, they experienced an intimacy with God. But when they sinned, they lost their spiritual life and that intimate knowledge of God. From that day onwards, people knew about God, but they didn't know God in an intimate way. Why? Because their, their zoe had been destroyed. They were separated from God. They were spiritually dead. Until we come to John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word. Now what is the word? The Greek word for word was logos. Now for any Greek, the word logos was an incredibly powerful word because for the Greeks it is all about knowledge. They thrived on knowledge. And John in his gospel begins and he says, In the beginning was knowledge. And the ultimate knowledge, or logos, has now become personal and intimate in the person of Jesus Christ. In other words, we can only be made spiritually alive again through an intimate relationship with the Logos, the Word made flesh, Jesus. In Jesus we can know God personally, just as Adam and Eve did. Why? Because Jesus was born spiritually alive. You see, we are born spiritually dead. Jesus was born spiritually alive. He was born conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was born spiritually alive. He did not forfeit his zoe like Adam and Eve did through sin. And in fact, he gave up his bios, his physical life on the cross, and now in his resurrected and glorified body, he lives today eternally in the hearts of his people. Which is why Paul could declare in 1 Corinthians 15, as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. 
all should be made alive. This word, zo, appears 35 times in the Gospels. I think God wants us to understand what it is to be spiritually alive. So what did John tell us about this life? Very briefly, three things. It is true life. It is true life. It is a life it is life as opposed to condemnation and death. God so loved the world that He sent His Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not die but have everlasting life. Jesus is the one person who can make life worth living and in whose company death is only a transition to a fuller life. But John makes clear that although Jesus is the bringer of this life, the giver of the life is God. It is God the Father's will that all of us should experience this life, friends. It's as if God was saying, I created humankind that they should have real life. But through their sin, they are spiritually dead and they merely exist. And so I've sent them my Son, so they can know him and experience, experience well uh, uh, true life, real life. Secondly, it's not only true life, it's eternal life. And the word John uses for eternal is A-I-O-N-I-O-S. Aenios is the adjective which is repeatedly used here to describe God. Only God is Aenios, or eternal. Therefore, eternal life is the life that God lives in us. So what Jesus offers us from God is God's own life. Eternal life is life which knows something of the, the power of the life of God himself. And he invites us into that life. And then thirdly, this life is not only true, it's not only eternal, it is attainable. In verse 12 of chapter 1, John says, To all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gives the right to become the children of God. <coughs> It's attainable for every one of us. And the word believe appears 70 times in Scripture. John says, He who believes in the Son has this eternal life. Now if we move back to our text for today, when Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly, what life do you think he was talking about? Bios or Zoe? Zoe. Spiritual life. We've all got bios. For so long we've got bios. But you see, Zoe goes beyond the grave. Zoe is eternal life. Jesus is talking about a quality of life with God that changes your past, your present, and your future. It's not just more of the same thing. Because that wears off. You get another car, whippy, you're all alive because you go cruising around in your new car. And as the weeks go by, it's not so great anymore. Because there's another model in the market that looks a lot better than yours, and you were ripped off, and you're miserable again, etc., etc., you see, when you just add to bias all the time, it doesn't satisfy. It's those very longings that God has put in our heart, longings for love and purpose and meaning. And we try to satisfy those longings by buying more things, a bigger house, a bigger car, and going on more expensive holidays, etc., 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 and we find that they don't satisfy. We're still empty because we don't have Zoe life. We've got bios, but not Zoe life. 
And when you find your way back to God, you discover Zoe life. Now in the story of the prodigal son that we've been looking at for all these weeks, Jesus very interestingly contrasts bios with zoe. You, it may not be apparent at first, but it's there. It's actually right there in the parable. Such as the master teller in Jesus. And it's reflected in an unusual Greek word translated as property. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. He divided his property between them. Now guess what? What is the Greek word for property used in this parable? Bios. It literally says the father divided his life between them. His bios. It's as if the father is saying, I'll let you have all that the bios life can offer. But someday you will realize that more won't fully satisfy. You see, the bias pales in comparison to the Zoe life that God wants you to have, friends. God doesn't want you to settle for the bias life when He's created us for the Zoe life. The Father wants us to experience life to the full. Life in Him and with Him. Now we all have ideas of what awakening to life might mean. But let's take a look at Three experiences the Father invites us to that can help us live this kind of Zoe life. Very quickly. And I'm going to move through some slides here. The first is celebrate. We party at the lost and the found. So what do you think? Do you think the Zoe life ought to be a life of misery? Is there something a man, you know, Zoe life? You know, the way we sing songs in church these days, you'd wonder whether we've got bias or Zoe, okay? Zoe life is a celebration. It's a party. Before telling the parable of the lost son, Jesus told two other stories of something of great value that was lost. You remember them. The first story was about a man who did, he lost what? There were a hundred of them. He lost his one sheep. So let's go back to the verse then. He calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. When he finds the lost sheep. So then Jesus tells a second story. It's about a woman who loses a valuable coin. And she searches it high and low. She eventually finds it. What happens? She calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. And then we have a parable of the lost son. And the son goes off and he enters into riotous living. He comes home. What does the father say? He says, Let's have a feast and celebrate. Because he was lost and now he's found. And so they began to celebrate. Now what is the common thread in all of the stories? It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Whenever that which is lost is found, it's a cause of celebration. If you have found your way back to God, you have every reason to celebrate. Because you were lost and now you're found. You've been given a chance to make peace with your past. You've been given a purpose and a meaning for living. You have a hope for your future. Celebrating is the first experience that can help you to live a Zoe life. And that is why we should celebrate far more often than we do. We should celebrate God's goodness. And we're going to close this morning with a, a song that talks about celebrate. This is where the party is. Because friends, if the party can't be here, it can be nowhere. Because of the Zoe life God has given to us.
Secondly, and very importantly, is we connect, we discover, we better together. A while ago, Edward Hallowell and a team of researchers from the Harvard Medical School discovered the two most powerful and meaningful experiences in life are achieving, reaching a goal, accomplishing something worthwhile, and the second is connecting, relating to someone in a significant way. And according to Hallowell, our society is becoming more and more obsessed with, with achieving while at the same time becoming increasingly bankrupt when it comes to connecting. And I'm sure you see it in the workplace all the time. People are so busy with work, they don't even have a chance to connect to even their colleagues who are working with them. Now, I'm not saying that achieving is bad. Of course it's not bad. But research shows that it's no substitute for connecting. In fact, people who excel at achieving but fail to connect wind up to be very miserable people. Look down the ages in history. Whether you want to quote Marilyn Monroe from way back or some more recent uh, 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 famous people, every one of them who has achieved, who has accomplished, will acknowledge that they feel desperately lonely because they've never connected. Whereas people who prioritize connecting, even if they fail in their achievements, generally are far more fulfilled in their lives. And that research is not surprising when you think about it, because God designed us, friends, to be in community. God designed us to be there for one another. I was sharing at two weddings yesterday afternoon, and reading that passage from Ecclesiastes 4, where it says two are better than one. God designed us to be in community with one another, where we can be accountable, where we can be encouraged. And I've said so many times from this pulpit, you cannot live the Christian life in isolation. We need one another. There's no such thing as a self-made Christian. One that becomes successful all by themselves. We are linked together. If we try to do it ourselves, we will never reap the potential we can reap together. Amen? Amen. A classic story that I read some long time ago, but I want to read it again. It's still one of my favorite stories. comes from an insurance claim on the insurance claim form of a bricklayer who got hurt at a building site. He was trying to get a load of bricks down from the top floor of the building without asking for help from anybody else. So he wrote on the form. It would have taken too long to carry all the bricks down by hand. So I decided to put them in a barrel and lower them by a pulley which I had fastened to the top of the building. After tying the rope securely at ground level, I then went up to the top of the building. I fastened the rope around the barrel, loaded it with bricks, and swung it over the sidewalk for the descent. Then I went down to the sidewalk and untied the rope, holding it securely to guide the barrel down slowly. But since I weigh only 140 pounds, the 500 pound load jerked me from the ground so fast that I didn't have time to think of letting go of the rope. As I passed between the second and the third floors, I met the barrel coming down. This accounts for the bruises and the lacerations on my upper body. I held tightly to the rope until I reached the top where my hand became jammed in the pulley. 
That accounts for my broken thumbs. At the same time, however, the barrel hit the sidewalk with a bang, and the bottom fell out. With the weight of the bricks gone, the barrel weighed only about 40 pounds, and thus my 140-pound torso began a swift descent, and I met the empty barrel coming up. This accounts for my broken ankles. Slowed only slightly, I continued the descent and landed on top of the pile of bricks. This accounts for my sprained back and broken collarbone. At this point, I lost my presence of mind completely. <laughs> Little wonder. And I let go of the rope. And the empty barrel came crashing down upon my head. This explains my head injuries. And as for the last question on your insurance form, what would I do if the same situation rose again? Please be advised, I'm finished trying to do the job all by myself. If ever there's an illustration of trying to do things on your own, that's it. Folks, we need one another. We need to be connected. We need to be encouraged. And while a great gathering like this is super for celebrating, it's not really great for connecting. And that's why I truly want to encourage you again, if you're part of this church, to get into a life group, to get into community, because that is where you're going to connect and where you're going to grow. And then lastly this morning, contribute. We find our way back to God, and we find our part in God's dream. God has a dream, and His desire for this world, and you and I are invited to be part of it, is that every single person would come to experience this Zoe life, this life that He has promised to us in abundance. You have a part to play in that dream, friends. His desire is that you would willingly risk loving others because you know that God has risked so much in loving you. Are you part of God's dream? Are you telling others that they too can share in this Zoe life? Do you yourself share in this Zoe life? You know, I've often wondered about this prodigal son who returned to his father. How would he have lived from that day forward in Jesus' story, if it had continued. I doubt that he would ever looked on a hungry man or woman in the same way again. Or that he would have listened to someone's story of failure and loss with contempt and judgment in his heart. Or that he would have thought of his father's wealth as simply something to buy him more and more and more in terms of status and comfort and so on. In fact, I think that prodigal son after returning, having had only grace reach out to him, would have lived his life very, very differently. In fact, he would have lived his life to the utmost, to the full. He would have lived so life in the presence of his father as never before. And so should we. Because when you truly meet God and you truly come to experience the life He's given to you, you'll want nothing more than to, to tell others about the Zoe life, to be part of God's dream for this world, to feed the hungry, to minister to the sick, to help those who are in need. Because that's really what it's all about. It's not about bios, it's about Zoe. Our priorities change. Life becomes about something that is better, bigger, and more meaningful than ever before. So folks, as we draw this series to a close, I pray that through the series, for those of you who have been with us over these last four weeks, that it will have helped you to find your way back to God. And I pray that you will just hold on to these five awakenings. Let's remember what they are, an awakening to longing, 
an awakening to regret, an awakening to help, an awakening to love, an awakening to life. And remember, you are going to drift from God and you might need to go through some of those awakenings again to return to Him. And I pray that you will always remember those five words as you do that. And that you will come to experience the life abundant that He has for you. Amen? Amen. And so may we live the Zoe life. May we celebrate and may we connect and may we contribute because that's what it is to live the Zoe life. May God bless you all as we continue to find our way back to God. Amen. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, you came to give us life not just physical life, but spiritual life to the full. Forgive us, Lord God, when we do not truly understand what that life is that you have given to us. And I pray, Lord God, that we would go out and celebrate life. It is one of the values of this church to enjoy life to the full. That you will enable us to connect with one another and to be there for one another and to nurture one another and encourage one another. And that you will enable us to contribute to your dream for this world. That every single person would experience this life that you came to give. And so thank you Lord for these five weeks. Thank you for this journey. And we know Lord it is a journey. In a sense there's sometimes not even a beginning and an end. But it's a continuous journey as we make our way back to you. And I pray, Lord, for every person here, even those who are perhaps here just for the first time, that, Lord, if they've been satisfying longings in their life in the wrong way, and they've been in this endless cycle of regret and longing and regret and longing, that, Lord, that they would come to their senses and turn around and head back to the Father and experience his arms of embrace and love and acceptance and that Lord they may experience his unconditional love and that they may live the life, the Zoe life that he wants them to live and so Lord Jesus just let us go out and live that life for you Lord let us truly be your witnesses and let us celebrate the life that you've given to us and Lord we it seems a while ago, Lord, but we dedicated all these children this morning and baptized little one. And we think as they grow up, Lord, that may they true, truly come to experience this life. And as parents here this morning and grandparents, Lord, help us to do everything we can to put them on the right road that they may experience that Zoe life for themselves. And so bless us, Lord, as the family of God, and thank you for every person here and every family represented here, Lord. And may we just continue to live for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.